it takes a special something to strike mortal fear into the hearts of Nazi German soldiers. To be deemed a witch by these forces is nothing short of an honor. An honor afforded to female pilots in the Soviet Air Force. They were hated and feared so much that any German pilot who managed to down their plane was automatically awarded the Iron Cross Medal, typically awarded for bravery in battle. But who were these women, and what made them so terrifying? Welcome back to Hometown History, where today we're looking at a lesser-known but indispensable asset in the war against Nazi Germany, the Night Witches. Imagine a bone-chilling night on the Russian front during the height of World War II. A German soldier, huddled in his trench, hears a faint sound that sends shivers down his spine. It's not the roar of a heavy bomber or the paralyzing sound of agonizing screams and wails. It's a whooshing noise, like the sweeping of a witch's broom. It grows closer and closer until terror grips his heart. A bomb is dropped. Chaos erupts. And then, silence. The sound he feared was not a figment of his imagination, but the calling card of the dreaded Night Witches. The Night Witches, an all-female force of aviators that struck terror into the very soul of the Nazi army. They were the women of Russia's 588th Night Bomber Aviation Regiment, a name that would become synonymous with courage and daring. But the Night Witches were more than just pilots. They were a symbol of female power and resilience. Every member of the regiment, from navigators to ground crews and support staff, was a woman. The mastermind behind this regiment was Major Marina Raskova, a figure of grace and prowess, and Russia's own answer to Amelia Earhart. Women flying wasn't an alien concept in the Soviet Union. In fact, the 1930s had seen thousands of them join flying clubs, their eyes sparkling as they soared through the skies. But the dream turned into a nightmare when Germany invaded Russia in 1941. Suddenly the skies were off limits to women, and despite being permitted to fight in the army, they were barred from the Soviet Air Force. The injustice of it all was unbearable. The letters began to pour in. Desperate, angry, passionate letters. Women from all over the Soviet Union wrote to Raskova, imploring her to let them take their place in the air. If we can fight on the ground, they argued, why not in the sky? Raskova, moved by their pleas and recognizing their potential, took action. She became their voice, their champion, and thus the Night Witches were born. During the bleak autumn of 1941, the Russian front was about to witness a historic change. The German invasion had shaken the nation, but it had also ignited a flame in the hearts of many young women. Raskova understood their longing, their desperate need to do something more, to be something more. With a deep sense of responsibility and a vision of what could be, she reached out to the very top, Stalin himself. Stalin wasn't a leader known for his sentimentality but he understood the value of what Raskova was proposing. The formation of an all-female aviation regiment was not just a military move, 
it had the potential for tremendous international propaganda value. Thus, with a simple stroke of approval, the 122nd Composite Air Group was born, an all-female force that would carve its name into history. Raskova, utilizing her unique blend of fame, connections, and unshakable belief, had opened the door. Now, it was up to these women to seize the moment. The day was October 8, 1941. Stalin, the Iron Fist leader of the Soviet Union, deployed three all-female Air Force units. These were not women confined to support roles. These were women designed to fly, fight, and conquer the skies. The Soviet Union became the first nation to grant women the right to engage in combat officially. Before this momentous decree, women could only assist in transferring planes and ammunition. Now, they were to become warriors. Major Marina Raskova was given the task of assembling her squadrons. The call went out and the response was overwhelming. Over 2,000 applications flooded in from women eager to serve, fight, and make a difference. With a discerning eye, Raskova selected around 400 women for each of the three units, most of them young and spirited students, ranging in age from 17 to 26. They were sent to Ingalls, a modest town north of Stalingrad, to attend the Ingalls School of Aviation. The training was grueling. Time was of the essence, and they were expected to cram years of learning into mere months to get combat ready. They were to be pilots, navigators, maintenance workers, and ground crew. There was no room for failure, no room for doubt. But their battles were not confined to the classroom or the skies. These pioneering women faced skepticism, doubt, and even open hostility from some male military personnel who viewed them as unwelcome intrusions into a man's world. These struggles were real. The nights were long, and the conditions were taxing. Simply put, the men didn't like the little girls going to the front line. It was a man's thing. This hostility and alienation extended to the tools and jets they were allowed to use. In the dire circumstances of wartime, the unexpected female fighter pilots were dealt a hand they could hardly have anticipated. Hand-me-down uniforms from male soldiers became their ill-fitting armor. Boots, several sizes too large, were stuffed with torn bedding to provide a semblance of fit. Their attire was a metaphor for their struggle. Women trying to find their place in a world designed for men. And then there were the planes, the outdated relics from the 1920s, initially meant for crop dusting and training, became their wings of war. These were not machines built for combat. These were fragile, open cockpit crafts made of plywood and canvas, described by some as coffins with wings. Vulnerable to the elements, the pilots battled freezing temperatures, wind, and frostbite. The harsh Soviet winters turned the planes into icy death traps. So cold, even a brief touch could rip away bare skin. The struggles didn't end there. Limited by weight capacity and funds, the pilots were denied the so-called luxuries that their male counterparts took for granted. Parachutes, radar, guns, 
and radios were replaced by rudimentary tools like rulers, stopwatches, flashlights, pencils, maps, and compasses. But adversity breeds innovation. The night witches found an unlikely advantage in their antiquated aircraft. The biplane's slow speed allowed them to outmaneuver the swifter Nazi planes. These wooden wonders became elusive targets, able to take off and land in the most improbable places. But there was a perilous downside. Under enemy fire, they had to dive and weave, lacking defense ammunition. And if hit by tracer bullets, the wooden planes could burst into flames, turning the sky into a deadly inferno. Despite the odds, these women took to the skies. They turned their hand-me-downs and relics into tools of resilience and resistance. The night witches took what little was given to them and carved themselves a new niche. It became their biggest advantage against the Germans. In a time when history's most intriguing secrets come to light, Hometown History brings you a riveting look into World War II and its hidden stories. But amidst your historical journey, remember that even during the busiest holiday season, nutrition matters. Interfactor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Factor offers fresh, never-frozen meals, ready in just two minutes. No need to compromise on your healthy lifestyle. Choose from over 35 flavorful options delivered to your doorstep. For those special occasions, elevate your experience with Gourmet Plus Meals, crafted to perfection. And when you're too absorbed in your historical research to prep lunch, Factors Lunch to Go has you covered. Fuel your body, mind, and historical curiosity. Whether you're counting calories or need a protein boost, Factor has you in mind. And here's an exclusive offer just for you. Head to factormeals.com slash hometownhistory50 and use code hometownhistory50 to get 50% off. That's code hometownhistory50 at factormeals.com slash hometownhistory50 to get 50% off. The planes were humble machines, capable of carrying only two bombs at a time, one under each wing. To make any meaningful impact on the German front lines, the night witches had to be relentless and stealthy. Up to 40 two-person crews flew each night, undertaking between 8 and 18 missions, rearming between runs, and flying at dangerously low altitudes that made them easy targets. Despite the odds, the women persevered. August 1942. In the Battle of the Caucasus, they soared, striking fear into the enemy. Their tactics were an art form of subterfuge and stealth facing concentric rings of German searchlights and anti-aircraft guns. Protecting what seemed like impenetrable targets, these brave women crafted a dance of deception and skill that would become their legend. The night witches were tasked with a singular mission, disrupt the Germans' rest and destroy their key facilities. Their strategy was as daring as it was brilliant. Flying in groups of three, they would approach their target, eyes fixed on the prize. Two planes would thrust forward, breaking through the rings, pulling the attention of the searchlights and guns away from their true objective. Then, with a sudden twist, they'd veer off in opposite directions. When all eyes diverted, 
the third plane would seize the opportunity. The pilot would silence the engine, and the aircraft would drift in, ghost-like. The faint whisper of wind, its only sound. Guided by a simple tap from the navigator, they'd release their payload, then restart the engine, fleeing into the night. They'd repeat this dance until every bomb was dropped, before returning to their ground crew, who diligently prepared them for the next round. This rhythm was their lifeblood, a cycle of danger and success, and it carried on. January 1943. They struck again, breaking through enemy lines on the Tariq River, launching offensives against troops in Stravapool and the Kuban River Valley. March to September 1943. Their relentless drive helped in the liberation of the Russian city of Novorossiysk in April through July found them dominating the skies over Kuban. The night witches lived by 12 commandments, the first of which was be proud you are a woman. They were fierce warriors, but they also embraced their femininity. They danced and decorated their planes, used navigation pencils as eyeliner, and found joy in needlework and patchwork. They were as adept at crafting beauty as they were at delivering destruction. Rumors swirled among the Germans about the night witches. Were they criminals, masters of theft, punished with frontline duty? Had they received special injections, allowing them to see in the dark? Such were the tales born from their impossible success. It's no wonder the Germans disdainfully called them Nachtsexen, or the Night Witches. And the fighters wore this name with pride. November 1943 to May 1944. The Night Witches provide crucial support in the liberation of more Russian cities from German capture. And they help take back control of key locations across the country. Their last flight on May 4, 1945, took them within a tantalizing 37 miles of Berlin. Just three days later, Germany surrendered. But the night witches weren't done. From August 1944 through May 1945, the women continued their operations over Poland participated in the East Prussian Offensive and assisted in the Vistula Odor Offensive. Their legacy between June 1942 and October 1945 was a testament to their audacity. 23,672 combat stories, 28,676 flight hours, and a staggering 3,000 tons of bombs and 26,000 incendiary shells deployed. Their achievements were not mere numbers. They were etched in the destruction of 17 river crossings, 9 railways, 2 railway stations, 26 warehouses, 12 fuel depots, 176 armored cars, 86 firing positions, and 11 searchlights. They also performed 155 supply drops, offering lifelines of food and ammunition to Soviet forces. But their story did not end with a parade or a monument, but a quiet disbanding on October 15, 1945. Their regiment was no more, but the legacy of the Night Witches continued to soar, unbound by time. But this didn't end their struggle. 
In the aftermath of war, when the drums ceased their beat and the skies were cleared of the roaring engines of battle, the women who had once been the heartbeat of the Soviet military faced a new, more subtle form of resistance. The year was 1917, and Russia had boldly declared legal equality for women. This revolutionary move opened the doors to military service. Under the banner of communism, women were proclaimed equal in every aspect of citizenship. Their rights and responsibilities indistinguishable from those of men. Yet the trenches of ideology often parted ways with the battlefields of reality. As the dust of World War II settled, the women who had fought bravely for their country found themselves confronting familiar shadows. The echoes of inequality that had haunted them before the war returned in the corridors of power and in the alleys of society. The law that had once promised them equality seemed now but a hollow cry, a tool to garner nationalism and fill the ranks rather than a genuine commitment to their dignity and worth. The winds of war had brought a fleeting recognition, but in its wake they were met with a chilling breeze of indifference. The struggle to balance family life with a military or aviation career became a battlefield of its own. On October 8, 1941, Order Number 0099 heralded the creation of three new women's regiments, a resounding statement of faith in the capabilities of women. But that didn't remain for long. Although the regiments were meant to be entirely female, they became intermixed with men. The 586th employed male mechanics, as no women had been trained on that type of fighter planes. Its female commander was replaced by a male in October of 1942. Following the death of Marina Raskova, the commander of the 587th, a male officer took her place. The dive bomber's machine guns required tall operators, leading to men joining as radio operators and tail gunners as well. Bit by bit, women got pushed out of their own regiment. These were the realities that the women faced, the paradoxes and compromises that marked their journey from the battleground to the home front. The roar of the engines had been replaced by the hushed tones of societal expectations. They had been warriors, heroes, and pioneers. They had flown, fought, and triumphed. Yet, in the aftermath, they found themselves navigating a world that had maybe never fully accepted them. A world that applauded them in war, but relegated them to the sidelines in peace. A world that had given them wings to fly, but never truly let them soar. But perhaps the most poignant lesson lies not in their victories, but in our collective memory. How have we remembered them? And how many more stories of women's bravery, ingenuity, and triumph are hidden away, waiting to be uncovered? If the story of the night witches has inspired you, intrigued you, or given you pause, I invite you to explore further, to question deeper, and to remember those whose stories deserve to be told. Until next time, keep discovering and keep questioning.